Here at lecture 26, we are at the beating heart and soul of our course, Differential Equations and Linear Algebra. We're going to put all the knowledge that we have together to do three main things. And in fact, I'm doing something different than I've done so far. I'm going to split the lecture up into three parts rather than two parts. A part A, a part B, and a part C. This is lecture 26A that you're watching right now. In lecture A, we're going to look at a three-dimensional linear system talk about how to find the general solution and a unique solution of an initial value problem. We'll look at the phase space and compare the answer with what we get with the matrix exponential on Mathematica. In fact, in this lecture, in all three parts, we're going to use Mathematica a lot more than usual. You can see lecture B, which is probably going to be the longest one, gets into a bifurcation problem related to the trace and determinant plane that I've talked about in lecture 25. And then lecture C, we're finally getting to our main application of linear algebra to differential equations, diagonalization and change of basis as a change of variables and ultimately a change of coordinates for a linear system of differential equations. That's our main application of linear algebra to differential equation, equations. So let's get now into the content of lecture 26A. Not a ton of slides, but these slides are real high level. We're going to have Mathematica do both calculations for us and see how to look at the graphs of these things. So this is a three-dimensional linear initial value problem that we're going to look at here. dy dt equals a times y, where a is this three by three matrix. Boldface vector y is assumed to be this three-dimensional vector whose components are little x, little y, little z. And then I have this initial condition, a three-dimensional initial condition. Boldface vector y of zero is negative two, three, and one. That's my linear initial value problem that I'd like to solve. With technology, and I will show you the technology after I'm done with the slide here, the eigenvalues can be found to be real numbers and fairly simple real numbers. Lambda 1 is negative 3, lambda 2 is negative 1, and lambda 3 is positive 1. Three distinct real eigenvalues. We know from some theory we've done recently that means the corresponding eigenvectors going with those eigenvalues are going to be linearly independent. They will form a basis for R3, three-dimensional space, and when I ultimately generate a linear, uh, linear combination of solutions related to these eigenvalues and eigenvectors, it will be a general solution that will allow me to solve any initial value problem. The corresponding eigenvectors, which again we'll solve with technology, are these. The, uh, an eigenvector for the eigenvalue negative 3 is 0, negative 3, 1, or any non-zero multiple. That is okay as well. That one vector is also a basis for the eigenspace. It's a one-dimensional eigenspace for that eigenvalue. It's a line through the origin in three-dimensional space. A basis for the eigenspace of lambda 2 is 2, 1, 1, or any non-zero multiple of that. That's, once again, a one-dimensional eigenspace, a line through the origin. And the same kind of thing happens for lambda 3. A basis for its eigenspace is 0, 1, 1, that one vector, or any non-zero multiple of it. In lecture 25b, we use diagonalization and the matrix exponential to solve this. But here we're going to do something different, something where you theoretically can do it without technology. So far, when we've done matrix exponentials, we've relied on technology. It's difficult to do without technology. But now we can write down a general solution. For each of these eigenvalue eigenvector pairs, we take an arbitrary constant times e to the corresponding eigenvalue times t, as a scalar multiple of the corresponding eigenvector. Here's what I mean. This is the general solution. K1 <clears throat> times e to the negative 3t, lambda 1 is negative 3, times the eigenvector 0, negative 3, 1, that corresponds to that eigenvalue, plus K2, another arbitrary constant, times e to the negative t. I get a negative t because the second eigenvalue is negative 1. Its corresponding eigenvector is 2, 1, 1. And finally, add k3, another arbitrary constant, times e to the t, e to the 1 times t, because the third eigenvalue is positive 1, times its corresponding eigenvector. The solution space of such a three-dimensional system can be shown to be a three-dimensional vector space of functions. Each of these three functions, without the k's, are linearly independent solutions and form a basis for the solution space because of the basis theorem because we know the basis, the solution space is three-dimensional. Therefore, a linear combination of them is a general solution. And I do say a general solution 
because I could once again take any non-zero multiples of these eigenvectors and get another general solution. The unique solutions of initial value problems are indeed unique if you solve an initial value problem and simplify, no matter which form of the general solution, you should get the same final answer. The K1, K2s, and K3s might be different for different general solutions, but the final simplified answer will be the same because of existence and uniqueness. So let's now go ahead and solve the initial value problem. Use that initial condition, plug in t equals zero, e to the zero is one, so all the e's go away. You get that this vector, negative two, three, one, is a linear combination of the three basis vectors for the eigenspaces. I need to solve for k1, k2, and k3 to make this work. This is a system of three linear equations and three unknowns. And in fact, because these were basis vectors, I will be able to solve this system for a unique solution for k1, k2, and k3. Let's go ahead and solve that. Again, we will come back to the Mathematica, but not quite yet. We need to do row operations on the corresponding augmented matrix. Remember, the system was that 2k2 equaled negative 2. The negative 2 was over on the left on the previous slide. Negative 3k1 plus k2 plus k3 equals 3. And k1 plus k2 plus k3 equals 1. Do row operations. Use your technology, if you like, to go from this augmented matrix to this augmented matrix. That's in reduced row echelon form. And we do have a one in every row, so there exists a solution. And there's a one in every column, so there is a unique solution. There are no free variables. K1 must be negative 1 half, K2 must be negative 1, and K3 must be positive 5 halves. Plug those numbers in, you get your solution of the IVP. There's K1, negative 1 half, matches that. There's K2, negative 1, matches this. There's K3, 5 halves, matches that. You can write it as a linear combination like this, or you can mash them all together in one vector if you like. How do you graph such a thing? It's a parametric curve, as always. Now, we've not drawn solution curves in three-dimensional space to this point. We've found formulas for solutions. But we are, with technology help, going to draw the solution. It is a parametric curve as t changes. This is a curve that, traces, that um, gets traced out in three-dimensional space as t increases. You could also draw it as t decreases, but for the moment we're only interested in values of t greater than or equal to zero. So we look at what the solution curve looks like in the phase space. And here is one picture of it. You want to make sure you get your orientation right. Notice. This is labeled with an X. What that means is the X axis is parallel to this line here. This is the X axis, and in fact, this is the positive X direction kind of coming out at the screen of the screen at you. This one, this side is labeled with a Y. That means the Y axis is parallel to that, and in fact, the positive Y direction is to the right. And this line here is labeled with a Z. That means the positive Z axis is going up and down parallel to this side of the cube here. So the positive z axis, you can see by the labeling, is upward. What was our initial condition again? It was negative 2, 3, 1. x is negative 2. So it's like you have to go behind the screen two units. y is positive 3. You've got to go to the right three units. And z was positive 1. You've got to go up one unit. And if you try your best to make it a box with some perspective here, and it's very difficult to do perfectly. Some sort of box like this, sitting inside three-dimensional space, it helps you visualize this blue dot, that's the initial condition, that's kind of behind the screen here. And the solution curve, it's hard to tell exactly what it's doing, other than that it's going up and to the right. It's hard to tell if it's coming towards us a little bit first or going away because we don't have the full three-dimensional effect. I will and show you in Mathematica, we can actually grab this picture and rotate it to see what's really going on. But that, in a static picture, is one way to draw the solution curve. As t increases, we move along this curve in this direction. As t goes to infinity, evidently the solution goes off to infinity in some direction. We can graph it as t goes to minus infinity as well, but I'm not. Okay? Because mostly we're interested in starting at time zero and letting time go forward. Let's go ahead and look at what Mathematica gives us here. As I 
I've said in all three parts of this lecture, I'm going to use Mathematica quite a bit. Um, as always, I put these documents in a Google Drive that anybody can access. If you have Mathematica, you'll be able to run the code. If you don't have Mathematica, you'll be able to open it with the free Wolfram player from Wolfram Research. Uh, but you won't be able to actually run the code. You don't need to completely understand the code, although this particular line of code is pretty self-explanatory. Here was my matrix, my 3 by 3 matrix. Eigen system finds eigenvalues in corresponding eigenvectors. This first list right here, those are the eigenvalues, negative 3, negative 1, positive 1. The next list inside, well, this next list consists of three vectors, really, written as row vectors, whereas by hand I wrote them as column vectors. 0, negative 3, 1, you could write it as a column vector, 0, negative 3, 1, 2, 1, 1, write it as a column vector, and 0, 1, 1, and they go in the right order. This vector here, 0, negative 3, 1, goes with the eigenvalue negative 3. This vector right here, 2, 1, 1, goes with the eigenvalue negative 1. And this vector right here, 0, 1, 1, goes with the eigenvalue positive 1. Let's just to do a quick double check that this really is an eigenvector for the eigenvalue negative 3. Let's check it quickly by hand. By computing a times that vector and seeing that it's evidently going to be negative 3 times itself. Let's see if that happens. This is worthwhile to do. So I've got A is negative 1, 0, 0, negative 1, negative 2, 3, and then negative 1, 1, 0, and I multiply it times that particular vector as a column vector. 0, negative 3, 1, what do I get? Do your dot products across this, across this row and with this column, negative 1 times 0 plus uh, 0 times negative 3 plus 0 times 1 is 0. Yes, it has to be 0. Negative 3 times the first component is going to be 0. Now do it with the second row here. Negative 1 times 0 is 0. Negative 2 times negative 3 is positive 6. 3 times 1 is 3. 6 plus 3 is 9. And indeed, 9 is negative 3 times negative 3. Finally, with the last row here, negative 1 times 0 plus negative is 0 plus 1 times negative 3 is negative 3. 0 times 1 is 0. I get a negative 3. This vector is indeed negative 3 times the original eigenvector that we were looking at. Zero, three, negative 3 times 0, negative 3, 1. It works. Okay, isn't that nice? You can take the time to check the other ones if you want. Right here we have Mathematica code that does row reduction of the augmented matrix so we can see what K1, K2, and K3 are. If we want to confirm the general solution and also our solution of the initial value problem, we can use dsolve or dsolve value. dsolve value's output is a little nicer looking, so I usually like to look at that. There is one way to write the general solution. Mathematica is using C1, C2, and C3, whereas we used K1, K2, and K3. Here we have the initial conditions in here, and we see that the solution looks like this when you mash it all together. Okay, which is the same thing that we got on the PowerPoint. I can define this as a function. I can double check that it satisfies the differential equation by taking its derivative and also multiplying a times it. And I see that these two things are the same. That's double checking the solution. And I can graph it in the phase space. We are now in three-dimensional space. And actually, this picture that you see here doesn't quite look the same as the other picture. That's because we're looking at this picture from another perspective. In this picture, the x-axis, the positive x-axis is going to the right. The positive y-axis, y is up here, notice positive 5 is up there. The positive y-axis is going into the screen. The positive z-axis is still going upward. It is the same solution curve. If I rotate this, over to about here, now it looks like the picture that you saw in the PowerPoint slides. And we can get a feel by rotating it some more that it looks like the um, x value here is increasing as t increases because we're moving toward uh, positive x values. Here's x positive values over here on the left. And it does look like we have initial leftward motion here, which when you have it from this perspective is motion toward you at first. Okay, very nice. <clears throat> This is just the static picture that I showed you in the PowerPoint. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and this is just more confirmation. I am also going to relate this to the matrix exponential here in a minute. Let's go back to the PowerPoint now. Okay. 
There we had it. I'm about to show you what's actually our last slide for lecture A here. I'm about to show you, find my pen here. There we go. The phase space, three dimensional space, in what you might say is a little bit, a bit more detail, with some other solutions in it. And also, well, not technically the vector field, but the direction field for this three dimensional system. The direction field that you draw for a three dimensional system is not super helpful. It's kind of hard to understand when you look at it. But I went ahead and had Mathematica draw it anyway. More importantly, though, we're going to see what are called invariant subspaces in the picture. We're going to see a cor an invariant subspace that corresponds to, well, let's actually go back to the general solution on the previous slide. An invariant subspace that corresponds to the part of the solution that involves the negative eigenvalues, this part of the solution, so to speak. In other words, let k3 equal 0 and just focus on this part. For, those, for such solutions with initial conditions that give you k3 equal to 0 and k1 and k2 can be anything, there's going to be a plane of points whose solutions all head toward the origin as t increases because of the negative eigenvalues for that part. Lambda 1 is negative 3 and lambda 2 is negative 1. Essentially, the plane through the origin containing these two vectors or points, if you prefer thinking of them as points, is what we call an invariant subspace. It's a stable subspace. The origin, which is the unique equilib equilibrium point, is going to be a tra an attracting fixed point, an attracting equilibrium point, a sink, so to speak, in that plane. On the other hand, if you take k1 and k2 to be 0, if you solve initial value problems where those are 0 and you just get something like that, where k3 is non-zero, eigenvalue corresponding to that solution is positive. You see that e to the positive t, that represents exponential growth. So along the line through this eigenvector, through that point, and the origin, solutions are going to move away. The origin is going to be a source in that direction. Unstable is another way to say that. And that's also going to be what's called an invariant subspace. The, the plane through the origin and this line through the origin are subspaces of R3 as a vector space. Planes to the origin and lines to the origins are subspaces. And solution curves that st start in the plane or that line to begin with stay in that corresponding plane or that line to, for all time. Other solutions have to kind of follow that in, a, in kind of a, a three-dimensional saddle-like way in this case. It's two negative eigenvalues and one positive eigenvalue it means this is some sort of higher dimensional saddle point is what we're about to see here. All right. There we go, more pictures of the phase plane. This one, first of all, what do we have here? <clears throat> this green plane is the invariant subspace corresponding to the two negative eigenvalues. This plane contains those two eigenvectors for those two eigenvalues. If you graph them as arrows, you'd have to put their tails at the origin and they would lie in the plane. If you graph them as points, where the arrows are position vectors for those points, those points would lie in this plane. That's what the green plane is. The orange line, a little harder to see that, right? Because it's just a line to the origin. That's the invariant subspace corresponding to the positive eigenvalue. Solutions along there move away. So let me add some arrows to this picture. We see some solution curves. We see some blue dots that are representing initial conditions. We see a big black dot at the origin. That's the unique equilibrium point. The blue dots, when they are in the green plane, this invariant subspace for the negative eigenvalue, sometimes called the stable subspace, they head toward the origin as t increases. I could add arrows to this picture along those solution curves, indicating that they are going toward the origin as time goes by. On the other hand, along the orange line like this, I only picked a couple initial conditions on that line. This blue dot here and this blue dot that's kind of behind the plane back there, that's the unstable subspace. Corresponding to the positive eigenvalue, the origin is a source in that direction, but it's invariant. The solutions that start on that line have to stay in that line. We see two red solution curves 
and you'd have to draw arrows pointing away as time in increases to indicate that it's a source along that line. Most, solu most solution curves are neither in the plane nor on the line, right? You're picking a random initial condition in all, with, in all likelihood, in all probability, it's not going to be in the green plane or on the orange line. Here is one particular initial condition that I picked that's not on either the plane or the line. I made it slightly above the plane. I also picked one that's slightly below down there. The pink curve, this one here, and the one that's kind of hard to see that's underneath the green plane, so to speak, are two solution curves corresponding to those two initial conditions. If you draw arrows indicating the motion as time increases, you would draw arrows that kind of match, well, the other arrows in the green plane. So you're sort of heading toward the origin at first, but then the exponential growth takes over as you get close to the origin, as you get close to the um, eigenspace here for the eigenvalue that's positive, this unstable subspace, and then you have to follow it as time increases. You are asymptotic to the orange line as t goes to infinity for all other initial conditions that are not in the plane. Okay. So it is some sort of source in this plane direction, sink, excuse me, sink in the plane direction, source in the line direction, and for other initial conditions, it's some sort of higher dimensional saddle point. And overall, you'd still say it's a higher dimensional saddle point. In the second picture I'm going to show you, I'm going to add the vector field with scaled down vectors, so it's really the direction field. But keep in mind, in this picture, it's kind of hard to tell what's going on. Here it is. Yeah, it's kind of a mess. Can I make sense of this? It is supposed to be a scaled down version of the vector field. The vector field itself, oops, I shouldn't have erased that matrix, is really A times Y, where Y is a variable vector or a variable point, and A is the matrix that I just erased. That is a vector field, and we've scaled it down to make these vectors about the same length. The solution curves still follow the vector field. Anytime a solution curve uh, is at the tail of one of these vectors, that vector is supposed to at least be in the direction of the velocity vector. It's going to be tangent to the solution curve. If it were the true vector in the vector field, its length would also be the speed of the curve at that point. Can we tell that that's really happening here? That's the hard part. Um, I do see arrows pointing in sort of this general direction when you're close to the initial conditions over here. And we believe that because we see these solutions for these initial conditions heading into the screen, including on the pink ones. Up here, it's kind of hard to tell, but there are going to be some vectors that are heading upwards. It's, yeah, these. I mean, you see some vectors like this and this one that are kind of heading upwards. It's hard to tell exactly what are happening with the other ones. And, I mean, we see some other ones that are kind of behind there more. I see some arrows pointing toward the origin over here. That seems good. Toward the origin back here. That seems good before they start heading upward. Yeah, you can draw it, but it's not super helpful because it's not real easy to interpret. A little easier to interpret if we can rotate it around like we can do in Mathematica. Uh, which is what I have down here further. And I need my solution in here. I use the matrix exponential in Mathematica, by the way, to get the solution. I, I made the plane, by the way, that green plane, by taking two of my eigenvectors for two different eigenvalues that are negative and taking their cross product. And I get this for the normal vector to the plane, and that allowed me to find the equation of the plane right there. We have talked about that before in this class, how to find the equation of a plane when you've got a normal vector. And the cross product can give you a normal vector when you know two vectors that are parallel to the plane. So this kind of stuff can help us make more graphs there. We see the solutions. There's another kind of fun things here. I can change the initial conditions if I like with this one. Move the initial condition around, see how the solution changes. This is changing the z-coordinate, this is changing the y-coordinate. Yeah, that's kind of a pretty one there. And this is changing the x-coordinate of the initial condition. 
This one, on, actually ignore that one, this one down here keeps the initial condition in that stable plane no matter what x and z are. I've, I, I programmed it to pick the y value so the initial condition is always in the green plane here. And you can see the solution is always going toward the original on that. Okay, and this vector field plot the vector, the vector field here, the vector plot here. Uh, this version of Mathematica actually doesn't make as nice of a picture. Um, I have a newer version of Mathematica on my computer that I made the nicer picture with. Okay? And that is actually the end of Lecture A. You won't want to miss Lectures B and, the, B and C. Thanks for watching.